Hi everyone, I'm Freddie Laker and welcome to another episode of OSHIP. This week I've got another wonderful friend of mine on, Mr. Bill Goldstein. Bill is the founder and owner of Walt Grace Vintage. It's an incredible uh, vintage guitar and vintage car shop in the Wynwood District of Miami. I happen to have known Bill for a really long time. Uh, we actually worked together when we were in the agency world at, at, at Sapient and uh, as another one of those guys that kind of traveled all over the world with uh, get, getting into trouble uh, uh, with clients and uh, you know, trying to have some fun and get some work done at the same time. And they're going to love his story. He's got a really unconventional path to being a successful entrepreneur. So again, thanks for tuning in to this week's OSHIP. We're back. So, Bill, just want to welcome you for show, coming up to the show today. Glad you're here. Happy to be here. So, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, Bill and I had the pleasure of meeting when we were in the advertising world together. Uh, we met when uh, the Icomo Group team joined the Sapient team. Bill's also got a, a big history in, uh, in Adland. Uh, we, I'm surprised we turned out to be such good friends because I, I did call him Goldstein instead of Goldstein for six years. And, and uh, you'd figure someone would kind of get it right after uh, three or four weeks. But, uh, you know, oh, shit, there we are. <laughs> I, I did it for the first 40 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, back and forth. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's always helpful. So I, I love, by the way, when, when we first got on video, I was like, wow, that's a great new vintage you know Corey's got in the background like oh yeah that's that's a painting <laughs> so, or is it yeah yeah so, so i think uh, for those of you that tune in every week uh you may have noticed a, a quite a big increase in the video quality this week uh so we're do, testing out some new new settings uh, uh someone told me when we did a test run earlier that they could smell me, which I'm not necessarily sure is a, is a good thing, but uh, yeah, exactly the face I made when they said it. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it's a good experience for you guys. Uh, but I do want to remind everyone that, um, you know, if you're tuning in for the first time or whether you've tuned in before, uh, that the premise of this show is celebrating basically adversity, celebrating a failure. I think there's plenty of shows out there that really focus on people's great successes uh, you know, having them kind of rant about all their moments of triumph and all their stories you've probably seen them talk about lots of times before. You know, OSHIP is that kind of opportunity to talk to leaders and C-suite executives and entrepreneurs and just other, uh, I really think, forward-thinking people and maybe hear about some of those moments when it wasn't perfect for them. And I think it, not only are those stories entertaining, but they can be very inspiring. And they let all of us know that, you know, not everyone's perfect. In fact, very few people are, in fact, probably no one is. Um, and those journeys are part of what makes um, being an entrepreneur and a leader so much fun. Um, so I'd love to hear, uh, you know, I guess- Segue, talking about- Yeah, yeah Bill, you've done-, you've done some, you've done some stuff. I mean, what do, what do you consider uh, your greatest your greatest success? Oh, wow. Um, I think I'm living it right now. Um, you know, Walt Grace Vintage, which was kind of my change of life um, project or kind of change of life, almost retirement, uh, project has turned yeah, so much for that. <laughs> yeah, so much for that. Working harder than I, than I ever have in my life. Um, but it, it really, um, you know, kind of the catalyst for it was, as Freddie mentioned, we were, um, or as you mentioned, uh, we were uh, in the advertising world for better part, in my case, 25 years. Um, was really sick of working with Freddie to tell, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I couldn't put anyone out of the industry. But uh, no, but just, you know, <laughs> after a while, kind of the, the, you know, a few things, the more successful you get at anything, kind of a lot of times you find yourself getting further and further away from why you did it in the first place. And, you know, Freddie will be the first to tell you, the two of us, we flew around the world to all these great, you know, locations you know, with all these great clients, but we really, we talked about advertising and marketing more than we actually did it. And I was a fine arts major in college, um, creative by nature. And uh, in the beginning, I was down in the trenches kind of doing it. I was coding. I was, you know, writing HTML and simple text back in the early 90s, you know, creating, creating websites. And, uh, you know, as my career went on and the success followed, um, I really just found myself un creatively unfulfilled. 
And um, this is and, a really common thing I see with a lot of the leaders that we talk to. And it's like, is this certain irony? I feel like that the more successful you become because of the type of work or expertise you have, the further you seem to get away from the work as you become more and more of a people manager or right. a, a paper person, or you become all wrapped up in the finance. And, yeah. and you know, we, we've had so even like a, you know, one, one Carlos Morales, Nemo, that you know as well, like. You know, he had that same thing where he's like, I just want to get back to doing something that I'm excited about because I, I don't, doesn't matter how much money you throw at me, I don't want to be the biggest, world's biggest paper pusher. Right. You know, I, I got a lot of flack in the 90s. I was doing an interview and I said, you know, the money became enough very quickly. And obviously it's never enough money, but I meant enough that I could live comfortably and I could be happy. Now I just want to be creative. Now I want that, you know, I was that guy on the L train walking with a big oil paint, wetting all the suits in the morning on my way to the School of Visual Arts, thinking I was gonna paint in the loft, you know, for the rest of my life. So, you know, feeling like a sellout, uh, you know, I, I at least wanted to, to do, remain doing creative things. And, you know, it just, it wasn't the case anymore. So it was time to, time to move on. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny too, cause I spent a lot of time kicking around thinking, you know, how do I make myself happy kind of within this, this cage this box that I made for myself you know and and saying you know oh poor Bill you know you're upset you know poor poor guy you know you you have the cars and the you know everything was great um but I was just miserable and like I said trying to figure out how to be happy in this world that I created for myself never once realizing you know just just stop and, and that was a huge lesson for me and, and not one that I found easily I I, I spent a lot of years really miserable and uh you know no one could understand because on the outside everything seemed great i mean i shared an office with freddie and i was traveling the world and doing great things but i was you know dead inside and uh you know i didn't go to bed the night before or wake up that morning saying i'm gonna quit my 25 you know year career um i actually i mean it sounds made up but i was in the shower yeah. and uh heard a song uh you know on the sonos while i was doing whatever, whatever it was that I was doing. And um, it was about a guy just like me who uh, in, the, in the song, he wanted to build a homemade submarine. And, you know, I was like, all right, sounds interesting. I'll, I'll listen to this. And uh, as I'm listening to the lyrics of the song, you know, it said his wife told his kids he was crazy and his friend said he'd fail if he try. And I was like, sounds familiar. It said, but with a will to work card and a library card, he took a homemade one-man fan blade submarine ride. And I said, holy shit, that's me. This, you know, oh my God. So for whatever reason, call it divine intervention or whatever, I, uh, I decided to turn the water off mid-shower mid and, and listen to the lyrics of the song because I felt like there's going to be my answer to my, my misery in this song. And I, you know, I'd never heard the song before. And uh, just as I turned the water off, I, I, the chorus came on and I hear the, the line that changed everything for me. And it was, when you're done with this world, the next is up to you. And I just said, holy fucking shit. You know, it is up to me. I, I don't need to do this anymore. I can, just, I can just stop. You know, I didn't need the money. I didn't need the, the adulation. I didn't need any of it. All I needed was just, you know, to be happy and to be creative and to do what I love. So I, you know, turned the shower back on, got washed off, you know, <laughs> finished up my shower and got out of the, got out and dried off my finger just enough to open my iPhone and call and say, I quit. And they were like, what do you, what do you mean you quit? Well, I remember, I, you know, and like I said, I remember you, you coming to me and telling me the idea and I'm, and I'm, look, I'm a pretty eccentric entrepreneur and I'm not, not, never been short of ambition. But even like when I was like, I remember you told me, I was like, that's, that's pretty ballsy. I was like, so like, and I didn't, you know, I didn't really think of you for that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, you're going to open a physical store. Sure. Never did it before in my life. And I knew it and I knew it. And like, you know, it's your, it's your passion. Um, you know, this is, obvious. you took the two things you really, really love in the world and, and made a business with it. Sometimes you hear about other people saying, oh, I'm going to take these things I love and I'm going to make a business with it. And it, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pan out for them. So, I mean, it was 
pretty, well, you were, we were nervous for you. And I think some people I, think, I, I know that. Yeah, your people mind were it. very vocal about it. There was almost an intervention, you know, at, at yeah. Sapien. People yeah. were coming up and saying, sounds like a great, you know, clubhouse, but but what are you going to do for money? And, you know, I just, I knew it. And I, and I you know, money stopped driving me long ago. And uh, fortunately, because there was, you know, it was pretty scary at the beginning, you know, like, is this going to take off? And it really, again, it never was a concern. And I think even, you know, prior to meeting you, prior to being at, at Sapien, you know, I did have my own agency in New York for many, many years. It was actually one of the very first interactive multimedia agencies, in, you know, in the world. And, uh, you know, no, not knowing what I didn't know or something like that, you know, being naive was really my biggest attribute and kind of going into Walt Grace was the same thing. I was able to, you know, I had no idea how crazy this was. I just led with my passion and, uh, you know, went for it. If I would have stopped and thought about it, if I would have told you the end of that story and, you know, how little time passed from me hearing this lyric to quitting my career, not my job, my career, um, you know, 10 minutes had passed. I didn't even go out into the bedroom and say to Tina, babe, you know, I just had this epiphany and I'm going to quit my career and open a vintage car and guitar gallery. It, it was that quick. I didn't even, you know, have that that moment of... I, I, I want to give people, people that are listening uh, just some... And, and, and I, you know, I don't want to... I know a lot of my friends try and be humble, uh, but I think I want to give people some reference points. Like, you've been your store now. I mean, just kind of want to leap forward and we can go back, you know, leap back again. But to give people a reference of how, why this sounds so crazy, but where you end up, you've been ranked as, you know, top 10 best guitar shops in the world recently oh, by like Guitar Magazine. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, it seems like remember. every rock star celebrity in town comes by yeah. your place. I mean, it's kind of kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've won, you know, an unbelievable amount of accolades in the short period of time that we've been around. And what was so crazy about the one that you're, you're referring to, which seems like yesterday, but was now almost five years ago, um, when we were just a baby, Guitar World did vote us um, one of the top 10 brick and mortar shops uh, in the world, which was, you know, a huge honor at the time, still a huge honor. Um, most recently, NAM, which is the uh, National Association of Music Merchants, mm -hmm. they voted us uh, best retail experience for uh, 2019. There was no 2020. I got yeah. a funny, funny question for you. So, you know, the, if anyone is watching has their chance to Google Walt Grace Vintage or go to waltgracevintage.com or check out their Instagram, you know, it's hard to appreciate just how over the top and how uh, amazingly and disgustingly in a good way decadent uh, the store is. And so one of the things that always cracked me up about your story when we chat was, I can say, yeah, you know, I've got all this high in gear, but now I've got a problem. Uh, people are, you know, bus, buses are literally stopping in front of my store and some tour, you know, of tourist operators have decided that I'm a cool thing to show all oh. the you know, out of town tourists, but they don't buy anything. They can't afford anything, but every, you know, right. you, well, that, that's not even the bad part. People are welcome to come in here and just, you know, come in and talk and, and enjoy the cars and guitars as art. Not You don't have to play. It's just, you don't even have to have ever even thought about cars or guitars before. But when you come in here, you, you realize that, we, you know, we're celebrating the artistry, not so much the utility of, of both cars and guitars. So it's an amazing experience for people when they come in. And I don't mind if they're just, you know, looking and asking questions. But you know better than anyone. And the fact that I'm even doing the show right now is, is shocking to both of us equally. Um, I hate to be the center of attention. I hate to be on camera. I hate to be, you know, talk about yeah. everything. And uh, that's what's happening now. Now the story that I started to tell before um, has become kind of like Winwood lore. It's uh, everyone, you know, the, the tour bus has come and they, I hear people telling my story on you know to the to the tours the tour operators and their little microphones and this is where Bill Goldstein you know and it's like ah. so it's uh, what started in the shower naked has turned into a you know sort of a an international phenomenon and um, I get a lot of uh, credit for being this, this brilliant entrepreneur and genius for doing this but it really was pure stupidity and and going for all cost into the wind and having absolutely oh, zero shit, time. Yeah, yeah yeah yeah. So what would you, you know, say is you know, there's obviously a healthy amount of luck that comes along 
um, you know, with with doing this kind of stuff. I think there's, I mean, I've got two questions. One would say, if you look back at the last, you know, five years or something, is there anything you maybe you would have done differently? And I would also love to know, is there like a lucky moment that you feel like something that happened that was unexpected that kind of changed your yeah. path in some way? And that's something I've noticed a lot of entrepreneurs seem to, there's something that maybe that, you know, just there's a bit of luck involved, but man, it changed the trajectory. Yeah, I mean, I think the luck was, you know, recognizing having that moment that I was talking about in the shower, you know, Walt Grace kind of wrote itself, you know, the whole story of Walt Grace and, um, you know, the luck part is that other people besides me, myself, love cars and guitars and recognize the artistry and the passion and, you know, celebrate the men and women that made these cars and guitars over the years. And, you know, I can live vicariously through these artisans that created these cars and guitars to get my, my, my uh, creative fix. But um, I, it's, it's so eloquent how you say it. I think most of us describe it when you start talking about guitar, it's like frothing geekdom. I've never seen anyone who knows more about some obscure guitar in my life. But I think that's why people buy from you. Cause like, if you're like really into it and then you meet someone who's even more nerded out by these things than they are, I think people love that. It's a, it's a great business plan. You know, outside of these four walls here, everything that I know is just useless, okay? And <laughs> but in this world. Peter, I'm a god, you know, I have all, I can tell you exact every detail about every year of every Les Paul ever made and, you know, whatever it is and, and Porsche and it's, uh, you know, you had to listen to it for years. You know how ridiculous and useless it sounds outside of Walt Grace. And I created a world where it actually, where I matter. <laughs> so that's a good, you know, that's probably a good uh, advice to to give to, uh, you know. I'm gonna, put, I'm, gonna put you on, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Serious, serious question. Go ahead. Cars or guitars? Which one? Yes, is there? yes is the answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and 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 as everything with me, you know. I, you know, you guys call me superlative man because I don't ever, I don't ever, I'm never lukewarm. Never about just one thing. There's no such thing as I kind of like that. It's either the greatest thing in the world or the or the biggest piece of shit. Yeah, and yeah. I, these are two things that I found that are always the greatest fucking thing to me, and they have been my whole life. You know, three year old Bill Billy is uh, the same as almost fifty year old Bill. Um, you know. Vintage Porsche, which were current back then, are still the same same ones that get me going, and the same guitars. You know, I saw Ace Fairly from Kiss playing a Les Paul in, in 1975 or 1976, and that was it. And Les Pauls rule my world to this day. So I, I, I noticed you have a strong appreciation for a good curse word to add some emphasis. Do you have a favorite curse word? Um, and again, all of them. You know, <laughs> not, I, I don't mean to just be evasive and, and not, not make a decision. Oh, 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 oh. Guitars, choose a, a favorite curse word. Would you like to know my favorite of my two daughters? Um, because <laughs> you're uh, asking, well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to ruin our friendship. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. it's that kind of swap. Uh, okay, one more, one more, and then I'll make you stop making hard decisions. Do you have a favorite sound? A favorite the things you, want, the things you, you know, love, they all make great sounds. I know, they all do make great sounds. You know, I could so easily say an electric guitar or whatever, but that's too vague. Probably, um, and I'm going to step outside of cars and guitars for a second, probably my Harley starting up. Um, a little bit of the fact that it's even starting up because I've um, taken to becoming my own motorcycle mechanic this year. Um, kind of one of my escapes, which actually I'm going to talk about in a second. I'll, I'll why I needed an escape because it seems like I have this amazing life. I'm around the two things I love most all the time. Yeah, I think it kind of um, consumed you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, what'd you say? I said, I think they consumed you a little, your, your it, favorite. It consumed your... you, but let me go back to my favorite sound and, and get one, <laughs> one answer out. Yeah. Um, favorite sound is probably my Harley starting up. Um, yeah. One, the pure, you know, sound of a Harley Davidson is indisputably amazing. Um, or maybe it is, you know, uh, up for discussion because I hated it my entire life um, until I got one and then I can't get loud enough I can't get raunchy enough and you know it's the greatest thing to me um, but what I was saying is the reason I've you know taken again to riding bikes and now actually building bikes and working on bikes myself it's amazing what you can do with YouTube 
Um, I'm a Jew working on a motorcycle in a garage. Go, go figure. <laughs> you know, I said, was that inappropriate, Freddie? Your face? No, like, no, it's totally fine. By the way, I'm no. I, if you see, anyone ever sees me looking around while I'm on video, I'm looking at all the different streams and all the different places we're coming in. I'm looking at different comments. Looking at all my awards on the wall. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm just looking at the different different streams and different comments. So, if anyone out there has any questions or whatever they want to ask, we're getting lots of highs from some mutual friends. Uh, but um, if anyone has anything they want to ask, uh, you know, feel free to pop it in there, and, and if we can fit it in, uh, we will. Um, right, so ultimately, let me just finish that thought because yeah, I'm yeah. all over the place, and I blame me, not you. No, so um, so this is superlatives again. Yeah, uh, the, the the reason that I had to, you know, start working on motorcycles and and living for motorcycles is cars and guitars were my escape. You know, you and I would fly all over the world, just be heads down for weeks at a time pitching, you know, jobs and working in the trenches, doing whatever it was. And no matter how stressed I got, no matter how consumed I got with work, the two things that were my escape were my cars and my guitars. You know, if I was stressed, I'd play guitar. I'd get in one of my cars and drive around. Whatever it was, no matter what was bothering me, those two things always seemed to be the cure. And, you know, people always say, you know, do what you love for a living and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, you're looking at someone who does what he loves for a living, and I'm here to tell you, they're wrong. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you're like I've been reflective you know, on this statement, and yeah. hell's fuck now. It, it's, it's actually probably the most serious I ever get. And the one thing that I could share, if you everything else in this interview, um, you know, just you turn off to the one thing that I could say that everyone should take away is you need to do what you like for a living, yeah, not what you love. Okay, yeah. and this used to be the things that I love and I still love them, but now they're my job. And no matter what it is, if you're good at something and you work your ass off at it, it doesn't matter what it is that you're selling or dealing with. It's all consuming. And this is consuming. And now what used to be my escape is what I'm running from. So yeah. it's not that I'm running, but you know, just yeah. metaphorically. And I uh, had to find something else to be my escape. And you asked me earlier before we did the interview, you know, why don't I have more motorcycles on the floor? If, you know, motorcycles are such a huge part of my life. And I'm going on a 14 day solo ride up to Sturgis starting tomorrow. And motorcycles are a huge part of my life, but I, I intentionally keep them distant. It's almost like having, you know, working with your family, you know, it's always a recipe for disaster and I keep, that really, you know, precious and separate from Wall Street. This is the exact reason why I'm not a professional exotic dancer anymore. <laughs> like, I, that's just for me and my wife now. It's, you know, I can't take my passions and make it my work because the magic goes away. You know, you just got to. Oh, thank you for the little show before the show. It's my yeah, yeah, no worries. Well, you know, I needed to get you uh, <laughs> in, both the mood, in the mood for the show. Hey, all, all jokes aside, you, you know, I know you threw yourself into it for real. How many days a week are you working right now? I, I, Pre-COVID, seven days a week, yeah. 365. You know, I, uh, I'm i here. We're open seven days a week from 8 to 11, again, pre-COVID. And I was here from open to close every single day. You think, and, you, you, uh, you, does, does, does that part of it, do you feel like maybe you're doing it wrong a little bit? Do you want to try? Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, everything happens for a reason and you know the reason we're all experiencing this pandemic is so i could learn this lesson that uh taking, it taking, a bit. Yeah. taking a break what'd you say it, slow, it slows you down a little bit it the, slowed me down yeah. and it just bam one day to the next um now you know i used to think only pussies took vacations you know and now <laughs> it's 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 horrible, it's, that, yeah, yeah. it's horrible that that is how I felt and you know it's, it's a really big part of American culture though you know I'm, I'm a pretty intense workaholic and after spending whatever it was 10 11 months last year you know working and living in Amsterdam and I started to realize like other countries think we're crazy I mean like they think we're they think we're nuts I mean you know we have an infamous uh work ethic when they and they and they're like no you guys are like, why would you do that to yourself? Yeah. I don't get it. And, it. and But I think in American culture, I don't know. I'd love to go back and trace the steps of that. Like, it might be an interesting blog post for me to work on at some point. But like, where, what, what was it that, you know, that we kind of built into 
you know, oh. that comes from, is it to come from the world? Well, our country is a, a bunch of entrepreneurs, you know, yeah, think about it. it. It's just entrepreneurialism, just so core, or is it, or is it just extreme capitalism? And, um, you know, I just, but I just think we all could use a little help of finding some work-life balance. Yeah, and I don't even think entrepreneurism in, in the, as we talk about it in business, I mean, you know, our forefathers, they came here with, you know, just a little bit of a plan and kind of winged it as they went the way we, we do so often. And, you know, you had to always keep the plate spinning, you know, and it's once you have success, a little bit of success, you know, to get to that next step, if you're the visionary, if you're the, the dreamer, you're the one that, you know, is carrying the message and it's impossible to, you know, to, uh, to ever let it go. Or at least it was again, pre COVID COVID forced me you know, into quarantine and to stop. And, you know, I, I additionally, I didn't know what to do with myself and all those things that I always said, you know, Oh, I don't have time for, I don't have time for, I still didn't do them, you know? And, uh, you know, it took probably three months into COVID where I you know, actually even picked up a guitar again and started playing, playing music and, and, you know, going out and doing stuff around the house and spending time with the family and, you know, really taking a break. So now that we're back open, in limited in a limited capacity, I find myself falling right back into it, and it's it's a horrible sickness that I have, and you know you've been guilty of in the past as well. Yeah, um, but that's why I'm going on this trip tomorrow because I'm forcing myself not to yeah. fall back in, and and it's really important to you know to balance that. You know, you asked me, you gave me you know some kind of preface to maybe what some things we were going to talk about, and you asked me one of my biggest regrets over the last year and it's more than just the last year it's like I always put business either ahead or on equal footing with my friends and family and it was always oh I can't I'm working oh my god I have this thing and my mood was always you know dependent on whether things were good at work or bad at work or I was overworked or whatever and now I'm trying to find that balance and it's uh, you know it's interesting it's an interesting fight that I have with myself it's tricky. Um, so I got, I've only got a couple more questions I want to ask you. Uh, it just, I think, kind of, I think, coming on the tail end of this, when you reflect on all the things you've learned over the last couple of years, this could be about how to grow your business. It could be about how to deal with perseverance. You know, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, if you could give one bit of advice to any entrepreneurs who might want to follow in, in your footsteps and the kind of direction you've gone, what would you tell them? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a real popular thing right now that we've all been forced to do and you hear it in the news and you hear it on business, uh, you know, blogs and everything. But, you know, now there's a word for it or maybe there always has been. But being, being, be willing to pivot, you know, I, we tend to think that our ideas are, you know, like our children, you know, you don't want to change them. You, want, you know, they, they are the way they are and, and whatever. And I was so resistant, both in at Raw Interactive, my my agency, and with Walt Grace. It's like I had that vision in the shower. Like, why was it etched in stone at that moment? You know, where it was going to be, how it was going to be, what it was going to look like. And I mean, I had it designed in my head before I ever dried off that day. And you know, I realized that life is never, and business is never, and just everything is never going to be how you planned. So, I mean, that's the only thing that is guaranteed that it's, it's not going to be as you planned it. So be willing to, you know, pivot, be willing to roll with the punches um, and just go with it because there's so many things like this year, I didn't have a, a choice to say other, you know, I just had to, I could either die or reimagine the business. And, um, you know, we, we, Finally got a website after you know five years of being in business. Um, I think I had a little bit of resentment towards marketing after being in it for so long, and you know I just decided I wanted this to be this organic thing, and that was part of my in the shower idea. And I was forced to. I said, you know, now I got to be online. Now people can't come into the gallery, um, and I did it. You know, hired an agency because it, you know, it was cobbler's kid syndrome. It was really hard for me to get my own site done all this time mm -hmm. and uh finally got it done now just hired uh you know someone to handle all the marketing and seo and you know it's the, the business is changing and that's my advice let it change let it you know you're giving it you know so much of yourself and let it give a little back and tell you where to go and people tell you 
you know, the, the public will tell you too. So. I think that's uh, good advice. And, and then, so we're going to talk, I think we're going to end the, this week's episode on something that doesn't change, uh, which is vintage guitars and chorus. If you, I want, I want some bragging rights stuff here. You get a free purse for for a couple of minutes. What is the, what is the most over the top core you've got in the shop right now? And what is the most over the top guitar you've got? Um, over the top guitar. I have, for me personally, you know, we keep talking about, you know, I talked about three year old Billy. Now I'll talk about eight year old Billy. Um, yeah. When I first, and I already mentioned it, when I first saw Ace Frehley play um, a Gibson Les Paul, I said, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And, you know, the, the rock star thing didn't exactly work out for me um, in the traditional sense. But what I have in house right now is Ace Fraley's very first Gibson Les Paul that he bought with his first record advance when Kiss got signed. Yeah. So he bought this in 1973. And um, we're fortunate enough to, you know, be the keepers of it right now. And uh, did you guys get it? him or did it come from another collection? No, it actually came from a mutual friend of mine in Aces. Ironically enough, Ace is a very close friend of mine now. Yeah. And um, as he's always been. We won't, we won't embarrass you with the amazing, we've got, we've got, he's got some very cool full Kiss costumes that Bill, uh, that can, Bill can pull out on demand. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Complete denial. And then, and then, oh, yeah, you know, let's see, like, as you dip down, come up with the makeup. And what, what's the, what's the coolest car you've got right now? Um, well, you know that I have to. Well, as I as I turn on my 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 uh, privacy glass or turn it off, there's a 1965 Porsche 911 right outside of my office here. Um, all original, original patina. You know the paint is you know not perfect, but it's uh, you know five years older than I am. So it's uh, that's pretty over the top, perfect. Yeah. Um, if I look beyond the camera, I have. Uh, 1957 Jaguar XKSS. I have uh, cool. first hard uh, removable hard top 356 here right now, which is actually the one that Porsche used in the uh, advertising and in the posters. That exact car is here at Walt Grace right now. Amazing. Well, All for sale, yeah. by the way. I normally, I normally don't, you know, plug people's uh, businesses, but I think when you go look at Walt uh, Grace's stuff, it's it's it's, it's not. It's not playing a business in a sense that there's just, it's so freaking cool, basically. So uh, for the, any of you who haven't seen it, go check out walkgracevintage.com. I mean, there's some seriously drool-worthy, cool stuff over there. Um, yeah, yeah. Wear, wear your mask and come visit us because it's yeah, exactly. the, 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 the real life experience is uh, it's awesome. I agree. Uh, it's, uh, me, it's definitely worth, worth coming by. Uh, Bill, you know, I got nothing but love for you. I always love seeing you. Yeah. It's uh, even great catching up, even if it's, uh, you know, through a shift. In fact, I think it was fun to share some great stories with. And as awkward as I could possibly be. You were great. You were great. I respected you just to be like sheets of sweat coming down. And, and uh, you're good. You're good. Uh, so you did, you did great. It was, it was awesome. Cool. Uh, for everyone that's watching right now, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're not following us already on Facebook or Twitter, uh, or uh, on LinkedIn, you can follow us at facebook.com forward slash your ship show, twitter.com forward slash your ship show. And on LinkedIn, if you just want to follow me personally, it's linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Freddie Laker. Great place, um, great place to catch us. So uh, thank you again for tuning in. I hope you had a great time. And one more thanks to Bill. I really enjoyed that. And congrats on all your success. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.